Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Vo. Um, I'm one of the registered nurse and midwife in um, in the ward um, here at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. Um, so today I'm going to deliver a um, workshop and communication skill in midwife practice, which is really, really important while you go on track. Um, the purpose of this program is to discuss the key concept of the communication skills in midwifery practice and explain the significance of the therapeutic communication skills to establish the nurses and patient relationship. So there are two lectures in total. Week one, um, we will cover the meaning of communication why effective communication is essential in good midwifery care and um, it will be in this room located in level 5 in bus week. Week 2, we're gonna cover the um, interviewing techniques um, which is the diagnostic and motivational um, interviewing. So, with the assessment, what's uh, I'm expecting you guys to do at the end of um, this um, program is the formative assessment. I'll give out uh, the handouts and um, there's some questions. Reflections. So um, you're required to write a, um, a piece of uh, reflection maybe at the end of this teaching program um, and it's you on next Friday. The summative assessment, which is your clinical placement uh, and meeting the communication competency of the platform, which is in your uh, facilitator. Okay. Uh, the learning outcomes. So by the end of the, this lecture, uh, you will be able to discuss three types of internal, uh, interpersonal communication in order to relate to therapeutic, relation, therapeutic relationship skills um, and describe two key skills of therapeutic communication in order to recognize the importance of women's perspective. Okay. So can anyone tell me um, what, how many types of communication when you want to communicate with another person? What do you use? Uh, there is a verbal communication, yeah. non-verbal communication, yeah. as a body language or uh, that's I think the main one, the main communication. Okay. And what else do you use? I think the kind of words is kind of uh, communication. We understand it by reading something. Yeah, written, um, yeah. written form. Yeah. Written form. Yeah. yeah. We also consider gestures and facial expression. Yeah, that's that's um, like non-verbal communication. Yeah. So that's right. Um, written contains we email, letters, report, memo, mm -hmm. text messages. Um, oral, verbal, like face-to-face, -face, phone call, calls, video conferencing, non-verbal, um, like we see here, touch, smell, and taste. Um, if someone tried to explain to you the sweetness of the mandarin, so the good way to give you the mandarin and taste it, so they can get the message across. Um, and we also look at the gestures, the facial expression and the tone of voice. Um, if someone, like, they use, um, they can apply in the pain um, assessment. You know, from one, the scale from one to ten, and you look at the, um, the patient face expression, you can tell how pain um, they at the moment. Um, okay, if we look at the model of communication, uh, Crystal um, came up with one of the first models of communication, 300 BC. 
Uh, I also recognize the importance of the audience. So the, the audience in the communication chain and the importance of preparing your speech beforehand so that people can get, don't get bored and they stop listening. Also, um, analyze the audience so you understood them who the audience was that you were directing at. So, for example, if we communication with a woman, we need to um, to be under her shelter. We need to really conscious, very understand of their experiences and what important to them and what source of information they need uh, when you're preparing a sort of speech. Um, Aristotle also said that the influences the audience is that the unity. Um, so the feeling as though you are working together and something like the politician said, but not in the real world, um, that not what is going, going out there so that you feel there's no unity. And the influences, um, the audience you need to bring about change. So you're able to convince them that change is appropriate. And this is the model of um, Aristotle communication. So uh, we have the speaker who came up with the speech, um, occasion or event, then is delivered to the audience and um, the effect had on the audience. However, if there's any lack of emotional, social and cultural influences, um, what's going on your your audience socially, emotionally, what their beliefs and value are, what their philosophy is, um, is all gone. So if there's any interruption here, is you can't get the message across to the, the audience. Okay, and of course the barrier to the communication. Um, if people put a brick wall, yeah, um, just don't want to hear at all. People really, people really quiet. Uh, they don't respond. It's very difficult to communicate. Um, so. If you have someone really quiet, you need to be really conscious um, so you can assess them, reassess them. Or distraction like television and computer. Uh, um, and gender barrier that people of, often say that um, uh, Men just want to talk about what they want to talk about, what exactly they want to talk about, and you know they just want to solve the problem. Women, and in the in the other hand, they um, they like to chat about things, often about problem. They just want empathy, and they don't want the problem solved. <laughs> um, and also angry, if someone angry and not listening, if you got someone angry and try to get the message across, um, you can't have to wait until they calm down um, so you can, they will hear you. If someone is shouting, don't, try, don't even try to um, reason to them. You need to reassure them and wait till they calm down before you do anything else. Um, Okay, today I'm going to introduce you to motivational interviewing. Uh, this, is, this is motivation for change and this is something that we, we do as a nurses and midwife a lot because we want people to be able to improve their lifestyle and we need to motivate them to make real change. Um, and 
we need to be accept right up front that people will change when they are ready, willing, and able. If somebody, if people don't change, um, it means they're not, they're not ready, they're not willing, and they're not able to do it. There are two levels of motivation that you read a lot about uh, extrinsic uh, motivation and extrinsic motivation. Um, things that motivate people, um, extrinsic motivation, that things that motivate people from external factors like Like it's things that motivate from outside that is going to control by others. So people being paid or giving money. People are motivated. They know that they're gonna have injuring so they wear glasses, their hair, they wear helmet. Um, because they know that they're gonna get injured if they don't. The instinct motivation and internal factor that drive you internally and you see many people who do voluntary work um, are instinctively motivated. They don't need to be paid. They know that they're doing the right things. So they know ethically and morally it's the right thing to do. It's their belief and their value. It's important to them why they do it, and this is the personal control that is what they aiming for. Um, and this is what we are aiming for, a personal control over their changes, that they want to do it and not we telling them to do it. In the process of the motivational interviewing, yeah, expressing empathy, um, reducing ambivalence, developing discrepancy, rolling with resistance and support uh, self-efficient. So I'm going to go through each step. Expressing empathy. So you need to work to understand the woman's feeling and current situation. So empathy, remember, is not sympathy. Um, it's not feeling what the person feeling, but it's understanding. So your communication to understand them. Uh, you use reflective listening. So again, you reflect what being said and you paraphrase and restate. Um, you you express you express uh, acceptance statements like yes, I understand. It's must be a really difficult situation for you. And you're accepting that it's difficult, accepting it's really sad, and you need to normalize the behavior. Um, normalize the behavior is like, uh, yes, a lot of people do feel that it's a very difficult time. This is normal response, so you don't need, you don't be, don't, so don't be worried that you're feeling sad about the baby slow heartbeat. Um, reduce ambivalence. So the next step, you got people don't want. The, you got people that don't really care. Um, yes, I know smoking is bad. Um, Hey, but I like it, so we need to start the interview talking about the pros and cons. Um, not you developing, but you asking them what you know about smoking. Well, you know, I know it can cause stroke and heart disease, but I like it. So, what's your response? Uh, actually, I explained to the patients about the like uh, the side effect of the smoking, and uh, 
I encourage him to uh, quit the smoke. Yes. I know um, we hear that actually. I like the smoke and I can't quit. Mm -hmm. But uh, you do your best with the communication. Yep. So this is really mean you gain the attention like, um, yeah. Uh, ask them what's the benefit of quick smoking, uh, which is the uh, pros and cons, yeah. the benefit and like, yeah. Um, so yeah, or hang out, maybe going out for a drink and not have a cigarette, so they can live ten more years more, so and they don't have heart disease. And the next step is developing discrepancy. Uh, so you're trying to find a conflict between the behavior and the person goals and value. For example, if they say, oh, you know, I want to leave till I can see my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. So yeah, um, if you quit smoking, you can live another 10 years in you can, yeah, prolong your lifestyle. Um, so we're looking, we're looking for the person to come up with that discrepancy themselves. The next step is rolling with resistance. So this is really mean that um, you come across with someone arguing with you. Say, um, they blaming, disagreeing, or arguing, or challenging, interrupting, or even ignoring you. Um, people, people are challenging you when asking their question. They go, yeah, it doesn't matter. My friend drink alcohol when she gets pregnant and her baby is fine. <laughs> so, what do you do? Uh, actually, I like show the show him like uh, the side effect of the alcohol during the pregnancy, and uh, I give him like uh, more uh, statistic uh, studies. Yeah. Show the there is effect, yeah. and I can uh, encourage it to stop that. Yeah. And uh, I will find like. Uh, Good resource and some more science. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah. 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 Um, because her friend, her friend's baby is fine. Yeah. To me. That, that's mean it's one case. Yeah. 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 But that's not, it should be not like a. Yeah, study. the rest of people yeah. is not fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably will ask the reason why she wants to drink for some reason. Because some. Some behaviors related to some reasons. Yeah. So the reason why, and we can address well, that. Well, because I like it. I like to smoke. The first thing I do in the morning um, when I'm going to dinner with my friends, going to the bar, I like to have a drink, I like to have a smoke. Yeah. So in that situation, I will kind of want to show them. Uh, could you? <coughs> Uh, uh, de decreasing some bottles of daily drinking or something because we have to know uh, how many how measurement they how, how many how much drinks, they, how much drinks yeah. they actually taking yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, basically pregnant women can't have any drink at all yeah. uh, while they're pregnant oh, okay. so um, even though she reduced uh, what she had every day is to affect the baby. So in this case, um, you need to come back to the very first steps. You need to come back to empathy, accept the ambivalence and encourage, um, create discrepancy steps. And once they realize when they realize that there's um, benefit of quitting, quit smoking, then you can um, go to the next steps. 
Okay, the last step is um, support self-efficacy. So when the person gets there, right, I need to do it, I need to stop smoking, particularly during pregnancy. So help them to recognize their strength, affirm their strength, affirm their decision. Um, that's really good. That's a really strong decision. How do you think you're going to do about, about doing this? So help them to empower, help them to think, feel like they're able to do this and uh, develop strategy for them to do this. Help patients to over, um, overcome their barriers. Um, well, you like to have a cigarette when you go out with friends. Um, so when you go out to the bar and you, you feel like you, have a, you need a cigarette, so instead of going to the bar, you can go to the coffee shop or go out for dinner. Um, so, yeah, empower them to argue for the change. I want a cigarette, but I, want, I also want a healthy baby, so um, they can argue for it. That's really important. <coughs> okay. Um, in the past, I like you to, um, one would be the patient, and uh, a pregnant woman, and one would be the midwife. So you try to convince your patient that she needs to quit smoking while she's pregnant. And um, yeah, um, you have five minutes, and then you change oh, the role. <laughs> okay, really good. Um, so uh, you can practice your your um, motivational interviewing skills um, in the next section. Um, thank you for attending the lectures and I also have the um, evaluation form so it's helped me to improve my teaching skills for your next, um, next year students. I'm going to hand out this and just fill it in and leave it in the table um, on the way out. Um, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Thank you.